Hey guys, uh, Valeria and her Week of Wonders. Czechoslovak film from 1970, directed by Jaromir Yiddish. One of the great films of the Czech New Wave, certainly one of the best known films. I hadn't actually seen it until last night. And I decided to watch it because I was just inspired by the fact that I'm going to be spending a few days here, more days here in the Czech Republic. And that I'm a huge fan of the Czech New Wave, which this film is going to help me kind of talk about a little bit. So, uh, first of all, you know, I've been working a lot today and uh, having watched the film last night, I thought about making a video, but I've been trying to make this video for a while now and things just happen, you know, and also, you know, I just, sometimes I just find myself dragging on and out about certain points. So the idea of this video is that I'm going to try and make points and just move on because sometimes I get stuck because there's so much to say about everything. And it's also interesting that I want to put that information out there in a video. But, you know, I don't want to exaggerate. And sometimes I feel like I, I have that in me. You know, I just talk on and on. But um, the idea here is that I'm not going to do that. Um, but just an introduction. So today I've been working a lot. And I, was, I, I just decided to go for a walk around Brno. I'm here in Brno, the Czech Republic. And I just decided to go for a small walk, for a little walk around the city. After about an hour of walking, I decided to just stop and have a drink. And I had a Campari, the most futurist drink of all. And as I was having it, I just, I didn't have my laptop or anything. I was just going to relax. But then I found that I had a notepad. And I instinctively just started writing stuff on it. And because I'd been thinking about Valeria and her week, week of wonders, as I was walking around Brno, uh, I just, I decided to drop down a few, a few thoughts. And I'm going to be using these as a reference point. The idea is to talk about this film and also use it as a starting point, but also see if there's a way that we can kind of unearth the things that are uh, buried within the film, the message of the film. I've seen videos about this, this, uh, this film, and it very often just stops at the point of horror and just experiencing it as a horror film, but I want to go a little deeper into that. I think, you know, I'm not making, I'm not here to make viral content, essentially. I'm here to make, to, 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 share with you the, my experiences and just put some information out there that you may not be aware of. You know, I'm here to promote cinephilia. I'm here to promote the art life. I'm here to promote art, the arts, and just an exciting, the excitement that it gives you. Uh, all right, so very briefly, you know, as I said, Valeria and her Week of Wonders is one of the most famous films of the Czech New Wave. And the reason why that is, is a lot of it is because, like I said, it's associated with the horror genre a lot. But this is not the type of horror, sh horror film that you watch because of the jump scares. It's a more cerebral type of horror. Yes, there are imagery that is very explicit and violent and also, you know, it definitely comes from, uh, makes it a part of the horror genre, but it's a surrealist horror. And surrealist horror, you know, uh, scares are a little different. You know, they're, they're, they're more intellectual. They're, there's something about them. And we're gonna try to, see if we can we can kind of understand it a little more by understanding the period in which they were shot and so on and so forth. So, but the surrealist part is very, very important and I think it is the key to unearthing that the, the film's, uh, the significance of the film in, in history. Uh, Czechoslovakia, which by the way, to people who are not geographically savvy, you know, is not a country anymore. At least it's not, it's two countries now. It's the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. So, but it doesn't matter. We're going to say Czechoslovakia anyways. So, uh, Czechoslovakia has a history, had a history even then, of surrealism in the country. Uh, back in the 20th century, in the early part of the 20th century, they actually had a, a very uh, personal, let's say, take on surrealism. And one of the earliest groups before the actual surrealist group of which of Czechoslovakia was founded, uh, was the Vietzel. Um, I hope I'm pro pronouncing it right. And in its first manifesto, it outlined um, that an artist's duty, a surrealist's duty, was to look at ordinary things and try to give a different interpretation of them or just look at them and, and perceive them and represent them in a different way, to look for an inner truth that w was concealed within it. But it wasn't just actually looking at things, it was also looking at the way things were told and trying to come up with a different way uh, 
just to challenge the people that were experiencing it. So it wasn't just about making art, it was also challenging the people who were experiencing that art to look at things in a different way. The, the Vietza wasn't one, then the Surrealist group came along, but when I look at the history of Surrealism, I think of Poetism. Poetism, I guess, was, uh, was something that it was a group that was started in the in Czechoslovakia in maybe the mid twenties to the early thirties. It doesn't didn't last very long, but it was a specifically Czechoslovak take on surrealism. In fact, its influence never extended outside of the country. Uh, but but as far as literature was concerned, and as I said, you know the narrative itself was part. The way stories were told was also important. Uh, liter in literature, for example, poetism made no use of punctuation so it was just you know imagine reading a book with no punctuation you're not gonna it's gonna be hard to strictly follow the story obviously because you're not gonna know where the pauses are you're not gonna know stuff about it so one of the I'm, the reason why i'm bringing it up is and it's very important is because uh this film is based on a novel by vitiesval nezva uh vitieslav nezva I don't think I said that right, but bear with me, you know, these pronunciations are they're tough. And he was one of the founders of, of uh, poetism. So it's important to keep that in mind as we kind of progress. But the whole thing about surrealism is obviously, as I said, it's challenging whoever, the people to look at things in a different way. And that is not what you want when, you, when your country is under a totalitarian regime, or in any case, you know, that was the case when the Soviet Union came to power. Of course, that was the case when Czechoslovakia was under Nazi occupation. You know, Czechoslovakia had a tough, tough time in the 20th century, let's just say that. Um, but we're talking about the Soviet Union at the moment, and when the Soviet Union came uh, came along, and communist and a communist government was kind of appointed as the ruling system of uh, of Czechoslovakia, uh, surrealism was frowned upon, heavily censored, if not downright banned. In fact, all art that wasn't uh, that didn't adhere to socialist realism was very much had the same had similar fate socialist realism was despite the word realism being part of it wasn't realism in fact it was pretty much propaganda propaganda art you know it yes it might have told stories that had protagonists from the working class and from the lower classes although mentioning class was sort of avoided you know because you don't want to do that in a communist system uh, especially the one of the Soviet Union of the time. But it really wasn't showing life as it was, but life as it should be, according to the communist ideals that were indoctrinated on the people. You know, because, because sort of like when we experience stories, we tend to identify with them. We're so well taught on, how to, on what to expect in a story that we start to believe them. Perhaps people did believe it, but Truth is that, you know, the socialist realist art wasn't just, was kind of, wasn't really interested in depicting real life at all. It was just, uh, it was just a part of keeping people at, under, on a leash, you know, just kind of showing them how they should behave. In the 60s, things started to happen. There was a whole class of younger filmmakers that started making these films that opposed the rules of socialist realism. And they were making movies that actually did depict real life. And some of them, and, and they, these people very often were inspired by surrealism. Because let's not forget, you know, as I said, Czechoslovakia had a long history with surrealism. You know, Kafka was born here, for goodness sakes. So uh, they started to rediscover surrealism and use it. Uh, paradoxically, they were making content, they were making movies that were more real than socialist realism, even the more symbolic ones invited people to reflect upon what they were watching and question everything around them, you know, uh, encouraging people to just look at things in a different way. During the 60s, these young filmmakers came along and they started making these films, and really part of the reason why they could make it was because it was around the time when in Czechoslovakia, um, there was a period of liberalization and mass protest which of course culminated in 1968 in the Prague Spring. Uh, 
but it didn't last very long, you know. In fact, by the end of 1968, it was over. You know, the political sort of liberalization that had taken that had occurred was uh, was pretty much stopped by the Soviet Union, and the right the right politicians were then appointed. You know, uh, everything returned as it was. But so there was this period in the 60s when these films were made, and they're great, and we remember them as masterpieces of their time. So films by filmmakers like uh, Milos Forman, who is definitely the most famous of the directors of this time, and one of my personal favorite directors of all time. But you also had people like Viera Chitilova, you also had people like uh, Ivan Passer, you had people like... Yarom, Yaromil uh, Yiresh, who I'm going to be talking about, who's the director of Valeria and Her Week of Wonders. And actually, uh, Valeria and Her Week of Wonders was made in and around Prague Spring, and it was actually released two years later. As some of you might know, even without having seen the film, uh, the, the plot is confusing. And so I see a lot of these people trying to kind of give it, a, give the summary of the plot, but there's really no points because the fact that the story is confusing is actually part of the beauty of the film. It's not really about following the story, it's about actually understanding the film in a different way. Um, but just very briefly, I mean, it's a story that revolves around the young girl's coming of age, and specifically her sexual awakening. And it's only specific because in the, ima the imagery is, it evokes sexuality. And it's been called, this film has also not only been called horror, but some people consider it, you know, softcore pornography. But yes, it could be. But it's not only just about that, it's also about a, a young girl discovering herself, her body, but also her origins, what, what, where she came from, why she has to, you know, be brought up with her grandmother, why religion is such a strong component of her life. And, uh, and all of this discovery is kind of, um, is portrayed via a journey that's sort of like a, an Alice in Wonderland tale in a sense, because all of a sudden all of these people, all of these vampires pop up and there's witchcraft and there's all of these mystic elements that, yes, are borrowed from the language of horror films, but they're also very surrealist, you know, let's not forget that uh, horror and surrealism really, you know, go hand in hand almost. But surrealism it still remains more important than horror itself because, like I said, it's not about the jump scares. And in fact, the fact that the story is confusing is actually important because if we remember what I said about surrealism wanting people to look at things in a different way, well, surreal, a surrealist mindset to some would also entail watching a movie but also watching it in a different way. So you're watching a film, but all of a sudden, you're no longer really focusing really, really hard on the story itself, but you have time, but the confusion in the story allows you to look at the images and understand the feelings that you're, you're feeling as you're watching it. Understand maybe some comments that you would miss out if you were too focused on the story itself. Uh, you take in the beauty of the images, you understand the poetry that is concealed within them, and so on. So the, na the confusing narrative is not because the director is careless. It's a device that he's using. Uh, it's, there's a reason for it to be confusing. Yiresh was not the only person around this time who was trying to confuse his audience. This was uh, very much part of a European f uh, mindset among European art house filmmakers. You know, people like uh, Alain René in France were doing it in films like Last Year in Marienbad. And then there was Michelangelo Antonioni in Italy who was doing it in films like um, uh, La Ventura. Uh, again, it was more because they wanted to c people to feel the movie. They, wanted, they didn't want to distract them with the thing, with the story. They actually didn't care too much about the story. It wasn't just about that. It was also about the story, but not about the narrative, you know, as the narrative progressed. The story, you had to find it. You had to find the story in it. And so we're going to try to do that here. But it's important to understand that this confusing storyline is actually a device. It's not something that was just done for the fun of it. 
But again, you know, if you're familiar, familiar with David Lynch, David Lynch does, does the same thing. You really have to find the story, and it's not the synop It's not something that you would find in the synopsis. You have to experience the film. But again, just going back to Antonioni and Vanet, where they didn't, where uh, Yiddish differs with his film Valeria and Her Week of Wonders, is that uh, Antonioni and Vanet didn't really do horror. So here we're actually seeing horror. So. And uh, this is important to know because horror is a genre that's all about repression. So it's the repression, uh, it's the things that are repressed by society and, or by individuals or by groups of people that all of a sudden come to the surface. And so you find yourself confronted with things that you try to repress, you yourself try to repress, or other people have repressed from you. All of a sudden they're in front of you and you're confronted with them and it's shocking and it's scary. So as I said, Valeria and Her Week of Wonders is not a film that scares you. I mean, it doesn't, you're not like, you might, but it's not really that type of film. It's more about shocking you. So you still get that response, but just, just uh, yeah, it's, it's almost like, the film believes that its spectators are in some sort of a trance just by the fact that they're sitting down to watch a movie. Very often cinema is accosted to dreams and that's true. You know, there is that link between dreams and, uh, and cinema, but it can be overly romanticized. Sometimes it's not a good thing because uh, it makes it easier to brainwash people. So in this sense, by shocking you, the film and Yiddish are actually trying to wake their audience up. It's like they're going, wake up, you know? It's this shock is part of Yiddish's intention to constantly challenge traditional representation of things, but also the way in which people expect things to be represented. It does this constantly. For example, in the story itself, uh, Valerie, you know, we expect her, this young girl who looks so nice and sweet to be rescued from this crazy world that she finds herself thrown in by a knight in shining armor and that knight in shining armor is um is eaglet and it, there's a little romance in it and so we also feel like we're watching the story of star cross lovers but as the film progresses we realize that they're actually rela related so that film stops that the film stops that uh the expected storyline of the star cross lovers and it's sort of disappointing in a way. I mean, you kind of feel like you wanted them to be together because they were sort of allies. But in a sense, it's even more beautiful to think of like them as siblings. But at the same time, cinema is so obsessed with storyline, with love stories, that we, we want that. You know, when we don't get that, it's like, it's a little disappointing. But at the same time, that's part of the, 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 the whole idea of the film is to upset the expectations and to also offer alternative situations for it. Uh, and then upset those too. But uh, you know, the way in which people are rep uh, things are represented in this film is also different in the smaller details. For example, the, the most blatant one I think is the, the fact that, you know, Valeria is raised by his, her grandmother, but her grandmother is clearly played by a young woman. She's not as young as Valeria, but she's, just as she's young enough, I mean, she's, she's definitely not a grandmother. She's not a grandmother. And she doesn't look like a grandmother. And there's nothing about her that looks like a grandmother. And it's important when we consider that aging is a vital, aging in youth is a vital aspect of the film. And it has a lot to do with the repression that I talked about. You know, there's a lot of repression coming to the surface in this film. So it does make sense for the grandmother to look young. In the midst of all this confusing storyline, then how are we to, f why do we still find the film rewarding? Why is it so celebrated today? And so I, what, I've proposed, what I'm proposing here is that what makes this such a rewarding film is that all of a sudden you realize that the story isn't about the events that are unraveling and what you see happening. It's about understanding the madness of these events that some, sometimes they're so disconnected, if not for the desire, for these, the repression that, that, that seems to fuel them. Uh, it's understanding that the madness of all of this is frightening, it's shocking, it's something that we've never seen. 
but that a young girl like Valeria, who's 13 or 14, is, who looks vulnerable, you know, she's, she's, it's, you know, she's, uh, she seems innocent, and, you know, we expect her to need help, she seems to be very much in control and, un and unfazed. She seems to be the most sane figure of the film, despite her young age. She's also uh, not, not necessarily excessively frightened by anything that she's seeing. She, she may be frightened here or there, but confronted with all, the, all of these things, you would expect a young girl to be much more frightened. And yet she seems to be pretty much in control, in control not only of what's happening, but also of her destiny. And this is completely different from the representation of the 13-year-old girl that you would have had in the films of socialist realism because it makes her out to be more adventurous, more able to take care of herself, more in ch already in charge of her sexuality and the discoveries that she's making. And it's pretty exciting to see that because what the film, hence, I see is implying is that a 13 year old girl represents the situation of Czechoslovakia of the time, which as I mentioned was all about, you know, was a, was a more re liberal and there was a lot of hopes for the future. And it's someone who understands her past, but tries to move on, tries to take matters into her hands and just move on and make things better. So she becomes the symbol of great hope for the future of the entire country. And it's fantastic because uh, what, what this makes the film is not only surrealist, but also uh, feminist, I think. You know, it, it, the idea that it, it, it represents is that, you know, it's it, a progression and an evolution in the history of Czechoslovakia will inevitably be a female one. History would only be on the side of this film insofar as the history of Czechoslovakia uh, some 20 years after it was released, when the Velvet Revolution happened and when in 1989 the Czech Republic was birthed um, and the Soviet regime started to collapse. But looking back at this film, its ideas are quite revolutionary. But then you would ask yourself, you know, if Prague Spring happened in 68 and with it sort of the end of the period of liberalization in Czechoslovakia and the end of, basically the end of the Czech New Wave, why was it, why, why was it allowed to be released two years after that, you know, period of liberalization took place? Well, the thing is, that there's another purpose and there's another objective of having the device of the confusing storyline and that is to confuse the crap out of the people the bureaucrats that were supposed to censor these works of art that were supposed to censor these movies so this is the reason why a film like Milos Forman's great amazing film The Fireman's Ball was censored and Valeria and A Week of Wonders was not. It was actually released. And not only was uh, The Fireman's Ball with its linear storyline and its kind of more blatant criticism of figures of authority and the, the, the system, the ruling system of the country, was, you know, this is why a film like that was not only banned, but banned permanently and forever. That was actually what was what uh, the ban, the censorship document said. Uh, and then a, a film like Valeria and uh, Week of Wonders was let through. You know, you can just imagine those bureaucrats being in that screening room and go like, this is boring. And, you know, and just going like, because they're not very, they weren't, you know, we, we all know they weren't very clever. So, and yet, you know, it's, it's an absolutely revolutionary film. So uh, this is why it was allowed to be released. But unfortunately, you know, it was also one of the last films of the Czech New Wave. After Valerie and the Week of Wonders, there were still good films being made in, the, in Czechoslovakia, but none had that rebellious spirit of the Czech New Wave, you know? Some filmmakers fled the country. Milos Forman fled the country. He really had no choice, you know? Um, because he really needed that freedom to express himself. Others had to just adapt, and they started making films that were much more attuned to the official ideals of the of the country and basically they were making the films that 
wanted to be seen. Some still managed to squeeze in some messages within those films, but uh, but Yerish uh, actually became more prolific because another aspect of Yerish was that he wasn't the most prolific of directors during the Czech New Wave. He was someone that, you know, it really took him some years before he would work on another project, you know, sometimes as much as five, as much, as much as five years. And so that also kind of leads one to think that uh, he put a lot of thought into his movies. So when you watch this film, you don't really understand it. You should be aware of the fact that most or everything that is in that film, and it's beautiful imagery because the imagery is so beautiful, was there for a reason, and he'd been thinking about it, and he had, uh, he had, he had given it a lot of thought. But I think that's kind of a concept that's hard to understand nowadays, you know? It's hard to come... And so as a result, you know, after watching a film like Valeria, you might come out of it, if you've had the experience and you have had this awakening, you can't have this awakening if you don't encounter films like Valeria and A Week of Wonders, so forget it, you know. You've got to watch these films, because they also give you the opportunity to, after you watch this film, you go out and you take a walk, and you're more sensible to the thing that are, things that are happening around you. Or maybe you don't go out, you don't have a walk, you realize things about your own life that uh, are not the way in which, you, you know, that are really awakenings that you only could have had if you, you really encountered something about a work of art, and in this case a film.